just a question actually there that I want to ask you this morning. Where is he? Where is he? I thought about that question even yesterday when we were here uh, at the memorial service for Brother Shatner Reisner. And uh, we asked the question, where is Brother Shafter? He wasn't in the body there that was in the, uh, I call it a hope chest for a Christian. But where is he? I'll tell you where Brother Shafter is. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's true of every Christian. Right. One of these days when you pass out of this body, if you're a child of God, if you're saved, you know Jesus Christ in your heart, you'll be absent from the body and you'll be with Jesus Christ. I thought about that a little bit. Do you have Jesus, now don't raise your hand, do you have Jesus Christ in your heart? Come on, if you do, say amen. amen. All right. Now think about this. This dawned on me one day and uh, it really got me because uh, I was thinking about my own mom and dad. And my mom and dad both knew Jesus Christ as their Savior. So the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Where's the Lord? All right, so here's the thing. Your loved ones are more in a proximity than you think they are. If the Lord's with you, they're there. Think about that a little bit. The Lord is in your life if you're saved. And I thought about that. Was Brother Shatter sitting down here, though his body was up here? Where is he? Would you look there at... Matthew chapter 2 and verse 2. Have you ever asked the question, where is that person? Or where is so-and-so? Well, here were three, or we, we say three, there were probably more than three of these men that were from uh, Persia or Babylon. There's a discussion about that, and that's not the point this morning. We know they were from the east, and they came because they were astrologers. They came looking for the special person that the Bible tells us in the Old Testament called the Messiah or the Christ or the Anointed One. And they come to Jerusalem and in this single verse we have two aspects of thought here that I really want to get across to you that maybe you haven't looked at before. They came saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Now, at this point, he had already been, uh, already came into this world in a physical way. Uh, boys and girls, Jesus didn't have his beginning there in that little manger. He existed from eternity past. Matter of fact, he said, uh, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. That means that day, Brother Ed, when Abraham stood at that tent and Jesus and those angels came along to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah, Jesus was there in a physical body in what we call a pre-incarnate condition. We call the theophany. All right? Where is he today? I begin to think about that verse. Look back here and let me read the whole verse in Matthew 2 2. It says, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are coming and are come to worship. Now, there were two thoughts there. I said, Well, I'll go and I'll have a word of prayer with you in just a minute. I want you to think about this. First of all, they already knew that he was to be in that area where the star was. Where is he? He's where the star would lead them. But he's just, those men were just like you and I are. They are human. And so they begin to seek human knowledge where Jesus is. Where is he? 
Well, he sought the people, and then he sought the religious leaders. And the religious leaders said, well, he's going to be born in Bethlehem of, uh, of Judea, as the Old Testament tells us, as the book of Micah, chapter, chapter 5, verse 2 tells us. So we've got to be careful when we're seeking information that we make sure that we seek the right information for our lives. Christmas is not a celebration for us. It's a celebration, celebration for Him. Amen. We celebrate His birthday. That's like uh, our girls uh, for a long time. If one had a birthday, the other one wanted to have just like the other one had. I mean, that same day. You know, uh, I should get a present just like it. And my wife is a softy. Come on. <laughs> so she'd buy gifts for both of them. And they'd be the same gift because at that time, uh, you know, if this one got this type of gift and this one got this type of gift, the one wanted this one, the other one wanted that one, you know, it's kind of a, uh, a contention. It's all about Jesus, boys and girls, and mom and dad. It's about him coming to this world to do one thing, as Luke 19.10 says. What is that? For the Son, come on, say it with me. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. Where is he? I want to ask you a question today. Personally, each one. Where is Jesus concerning your life today? Where is he? Now, I want you to think about that as I lead us in prayer. Would you bow your heads in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we come before you now this morning. We thank you for the fact that you sent your son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so this morning, I pray that every person will ask, answer the question, where is he concerning their own life? Where is this one that's special, that's the, called the Son of God, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the one to save his people from their sins? I pray that each one of us will answer that in a positive way this morning. And that we will seek to know him in a greater way. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So where is he? I want you to take your Bible this morning. Turn back to the Old Testament first. To the book of Numbers, if you would. Numbers chapter number 24. And I want you to look there at verse number 17, if you would. Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17. This verse here in Numbers is a what we call a messianic verse. A verse relating to the fact of a person who would be Jesus would come into this world. And I want you to look at it very carefully if you would. It says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Selah. God says, back here in the Old Testament, I'm giving you a prophecy of one who is going to come into this world, and that one is my son, Jesus Christ. Look at it again. There are several thoughts there we could bring out. I'm not going to preach on this particular verse altogether, but it says, There shall come a star out of Jacob. Now, Jacob, before, after, he, after his name was uh, uh, changed, was Israel. Jesus Christ would come out of Israel or the tribes of Israel. And specifically, he would come out of one special tribe. What tribe was that, folks? Judah. Judah. 
All right? But he would come out of Israel. God gave 12 tribes. And he chose one tribe in particular. And because of that, it also gave him another name. And that is, he was going to be a ruler. He is not right now ruling in every person's life. The Bible says it will be a scepter. A scepter was a picture of that uh, individual who would rule. And Jesus is going to rule and reign one of these days. But I want to tell you something right now. My personal life, he is ruling and reigning in my life. I'm going to ask you a question. Is Jesus Christ sitting up on the throne of your life? Where is he in regards to your life? Well, let's go back a little bit and let's talk about it. When the wise men came to Jerusalem, they said, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? And they knew definitely where he would be because the Bible always gives the right answer. Amen. Amen. He would be in Bethlehem. Someone stated, Bethlehem's stable was the first step in God's journey of love to the cross. And that's true. Because Jesus came to this world to die for your sins and my sins. It was the very first step in order for you so you could go to heaven when you die if you trust him as your savior. Where is he? He's in Bethlehem because he's fulfilling what God promised. And folks, God always keeps his promises. Amen. Always. Amen. And I gave you the verse just a little bit ago, Micah 5, 2. Listen to it. But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. In other words, he tells us two important things there. Well, actually three, where he would be born as a little child because he took upon him a physical body like you and me so he can understand your problems, teens. When you go through a problem, Jesus already understands the problem you're going through. Amen. So he became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. Secondly, we see something there in that verse. We see that the fact that he was going to be born just like God said he would be in a location called Bethlehem. That was before the New Testament was even written. God gives us the truth about things. If you want to know what God has for your life, look in the book. Amen. This Bible has the answer for your life. Uh, young folks, listen. This is more up to date than your science book. Now, I know because I used to teach science, and every year the books would actually change. God's book doesn't change, folks. It's the same. Because to change it would be changing God's character because this is his word, see? Then there's another thing that's found in that little verse, and that is he's going to be a ruler. And one of these days, Jesus is going to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. Can I hear an amen? amen. But there's another thing there in the latter part of the verse, and that is it says, His goings forth have been of old from everlasting. Jesus is eternal like the Father. Matter of fact, he said he thought not robbery to be equal with God. He is God manifested in the flesh for you and me. He came to be outward in his representation to show every person how much he loves them. He became like you and I are so he could show his expression of love to you and me. But he, he's in Bethlehem. But notice something else if you take there and look at chapter, Matthew chapter 1. Go back to verse 23, would you please? He 
is in Bethlehem, the wise men are told. But there's a second thing. It says, he is with us. Look here at verse number 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name what, folks? Amen. But it doesn't stop there. He explains the definition of that word, Emmanuel. What is it? Read with me if you would. Which being interpreted is God with us. God came to dwell among man so he could feel the feelings of, he could have the feelings of our infirmities. He could understand the problems we're going through. He could deal with the problems. He's with us. Uh, that is an interesting thing. Because in the book of John, it tells us, Believe me that I'm in the Father. And the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. You see, when you come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, He comes to live within your life. Amen. You see, that's why we can be called a Christian. God gave His Son to come to this world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved and He could dwell among us. He could have a part in our life. Wait a minute. Look back at Matthew chapter 2. There's something else here. He's not only in Bethlehem. He is in your life. If you know him as Savior, he's with us. But I saw something else. He is in the pursuit of your life. He's in the pursuit of your life. These wise men, and by the way, wisdom... Wise, wisdom is knowing what's right to do and doing it. These wise men knew what was right to do, and they did it. They went under God's leadership, and they went to seek Jesus. And you've heard the statement before, but wise men always seek Jesus. Amen. Are you wise? Do you seek him? Do you seek him of a morning? When you wake up, do you seek him of a day by letting him walk with you and talk with you and live in and through your life? He is in pursuit of your life. Uh, you're in Matthew. Turn over to the book of John 14, would you please? John chapter 14, and look at verse number 20, if you would. I gave you this verse a while ago, but I want you to see where it's located, and I want you to get a hold of this. And ask yourself the question, is he in your life? Look at it. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. No other person can tell you, only you know if Jesus is in your life today. So you have to ask yourself the question, are you listening? Has there been a time in your life, young people, mom, dad, when you personally because you wanted it, not because you did it, because it was a going thing or whatever it might be. We've had people do that. But has there truly been a time in your life when you bowed your heart in humble submission to the Lord and you said, Lord, I really want you to come into my life and I want you to save me from my sin. I want you to take me to heaven when I, I die. Is he in your life today? I trust he is, but if he isn't, towards the end of the service, you'll have that opportunity to invite him into your life. But is he in your life? Now, why is he pursuing your life? Well, the first thing is, he's pursuing you because he wants to save you from your sin. 
He doesn't, listen, Jesus didn't come to this world just uh, 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 to be a man. He's the God-man. And he came to this world to pursue you because he wants to give you eternal life because you could not get eternal life any other way except through him. Amen. He wants to give it to you as a free gift. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. You see, your destination and my destination is this. In Romans chapter 6 verse 23 it says, For the wages of sin is what? Amen. Death. Now let me explain a little bit. We know that all of us are going to die physically regardless. This physical body is going to die. Death means this. It means to be separated. If you're dead physically, you're separated from the living. But there's a second death the Bible talks about. It's called the second death because you'll be separated from God for all eternity. And Jesus came to deliver us from that second death. If you don't know where that's found, let's turn to it in the book of Revelation chapter number 20. Revelation chapter 20. And look at verse number 11. I'm going to read down to verse 15. You see, Jesus is in pursuit of your life, folks. Whoever you are this morning, you know whether you know Jesus in your heart, in your life today. But he's in pursuit because he wants you to be saved. Listen, Christmas is completely nothing if you don't know why Jesus came into this world in the first place. Amen. Amen. Now look at verse number 11. I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face and the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written, uh, written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged at men according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. Say it with me. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God doesn't desire that for any person's life. But if you choose, God will let you choose to go to hell rather than to heaven. He, now by the way, lake of fire, you don't hear too much about this. Yes, there's a hell. You believe that? Amen. Amen. If you die without Jesus Christ, you'd be cast into the hell today. Those who are saved, be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord. They'll go to heaven. But one of these days, that hell, that every person, from the, from the first person that didn't accept Christ, up to the last person who didn't accept Christ, will be raised up, out of hell, and hell itself will be cast in the lake of fire in all those who know not Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's a sad thing, isn't it? Amen. When Jesus died, then you would never have to have that happen to your life. Well, let me ask you a question. Where's Jesus in your life? Is he your Savior? You see, is in your life for salvation. He's in your life as a Christian for change. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You see, God wants you to be changed, to be made like unto his son, Jesus Christ. That is, in our life, the way we do things, the way we live, the actions we perform, uh, the, the, the choices that we make. Then he's in your life to enable you to live each day by his power. You see, God doesn't want you to produce the works of the flesh. He wants you to live the right type of life. God wants you to be a success. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. You say, preacher, prove it. 
All right? Let's all turn to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. All right? Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Now, uh, God's philosophy of success is much different than the world. So get the understanding here. He's not saying that you're going to be rich. You're going to be rich in Jesus Christ, and you're going to have much more than what you think rather than all the financial gain that you think you can get. But look here at Joshua 1.8. He says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Now read it with me. For then thou shalt make thy way. Come on, say it. And then thou shalt have what? Say it out loud. Good success. There's a difference between just success and good success. You see, you can have all the money in the world, you can have all the material things in the world, and have nothing. Because right. you can be the loneliest person in the world, though you have all the goodies, though you have all the toys in this life. And by the way, men, we have our toys, don't we? And ladies, you do too. We have the toys of life, but are those toys bringing you peace? Are those toys bringing you joy? Uh, have you ever noticed this? I noticed this when our kids were younger. Uh, boy, they were excited, Brother Charlie. They got that present, you know, that special thing they wanted to have. A week or two later, maybe a month, they lay that toy aside and they hardly ever go back to it. Because I want to tell you why. Things, our toys, do not make us content. Right. Jesus is the one that brings contentment and peace and joy in your life. Amen. So I want to ask you a question. Where is he? He's in pursuit of your life. Look at chapter 2 and verse 2 again. Is he in your worship? Is he truly in your worship? Look at him. Verse 2 of chapter 2 of Matthew. Saying, where is he that's born a king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to do what? Say it out loud. Worship him. I want to ask you a question this morning. When you come to church, do you worship him? Uh, do you worship him every day in your life? Amen. God wants that. Are we worshiping things rather than God? Here were these kings. They had everything. But they needed something else. They wanted to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, by the way, that's why Herod got mad because they were going to worship someone else rather than him. And look, human worship was big time back then. I mean, go back to the Babylonian Empire. Who was one of the big kings that wanted to worship? Man of the name of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. They wanted worship. Uh, how do we know that? Well, he had a great image of himself built, didn't he? And every person was to bow down and worship that image of that king. Where's your worship today? Is he in your worship do you come to church to give him adoration for his life? Do you come to get what he wants for your life? And when you sing the songs, and by the way, I love the old hymnal. I love the old songs. I'm not, I'm not against some good songs today that are good worship songs, but I'm going to tell you something. I believe there's a lot of songs in our churches today that are not pleasing to the Lord. Come on. Oh, that was weak. Do you know where a lot of that music brings people to? 
looking at self. More attention given to them rather than the Lord. Now, I don't belittle the, the people who sing in a service. I, Lydia, I appreciate those songs yesterday. Those were a blessing. It was good. And all that type of thing should exalt the Lord, not bring him down and put him in a wrong level. But I want to ask you a question. Is he in your worship? In the things that you do in worship? What motivates you to worship the Lord? In the spirit of holiness. Folks, we have a holy God. Amen. And he's particular about the worship that we give him. Why do I go to church? We should go to church to worship him. Amen. Amen. Is he in your worship? Saying, where is he that's born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. You see, we have a need to worship the Lord. And you will worship something. Amen. Whether you worship God in spirit and truth or not, you're going to worship somebody. Now, wait a minute. They came prepared to worship. They came and gave to him. And you know all about the story. I'll have to tell you what they gave him. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Valuable things they brought to Jesus. I want to ask you a question. When was the last time that you brought something to the Lord? in a worship mood and mode. Giving him, the best thing you can give him is yourself. Amen. Give him yourself. Why? He gave his all for you. What's wrong with you giving yourself to him? By the way, he has everything good for you in mind. So why not give it to him? But I want to ask you a question. Is he not only in your worship, is he in your thinking? If you look back to this verse in chapter 2 and verse 2, their thinking was to get to that person called Jesus, the Messiah, so they could worship him. Their thinking was right. And by the way, the Bible says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Let's say that together. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What you think is what you will become. Is Jesus in your thinking? Because his thinking would be those things that are lovely, just, of good report, of honesty, of purity, of trustworthiness, and all the rest. Is he in your thinking? Let me give you something else. Would you look down at verse number 11 of Matthew chapter 2? Look at verse 11 real quickly, because I'm going to be closing in just a few minutes. Hang on. Is he in your schedule? Do you have the Lord in your schedule? Look at verse 11. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. See, is he in your schedule? Those wise men had Jesus in their schedule. That's why they were looking for him. Is he in your daily schedule? Is he in your weekly schedule that you have time for him? Ah. Do you set aside? Now, I realize there are exceptions to this. Some of you have to work sometimes on Sunday, right? But is he in your schedule on a Sunday? You say, preacher, it's easy for you to be in church because you're the pastor. I want to tell you something. There were years, 20 years, that I was not a pastor. But I was in church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. He was in my schedule. 
He's in my schedule now, not because I have to, because I'm your pastor, but because I want to. I want to be in God's house because the Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves in the house of God, as the manner of some is, but you and I have the opportunity every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, to be in God's house. But let me ask you a few more questions. Is he in your daily schedule of Bible reading, prayer, witnessing, being an example? But let me hasten very quickly. Is he going to be in your Christmas? It's his birthday. Hello? Will he be in your Christmas or is it just a time that you're passing out gifts to everybody and smiling and, and then having a big uh, dinner or whatever time you have your uh, eating occasion? Let me challenge you to do this. If you have not done this, that you, if, whether you have a, a full family that will come and be with you on Christmas Day, by the way, I hope you'll be bringing somebody on that Sunday. We'll have some great music of specials that we have on that Sunday. We've lined up. I hope you'll be excited about it. But we're going to be here from 9 to 10 o'clock. After all, it's his birthday, so we've got to give him time on Christmas Day, right? Amen. And, and, and some people say, well, how do you know that that is really Christmas Day? That's the day we celebrate it. Look, I'm not going to argue over a point like that, when he was born, so forth and so on. I just know he came to this earth and we celebrate it. We ought to give him honor. Where is he? Well, let me close with this verse. Would you take your Bible and turn over to the book of Hebrews chapter 1. Where is Jesus right now? now? Let me give you a few verses. Hebrews chapter 1 to begin with. Hebrews 1. And look at verse number 3. Where is Jesus? Here he is. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, read it with me, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is in heaven praying for you. Praying for you. Praying for you. Praying for you and praying for me. Amen. And all those are watching by means of the internet. Jesus is praying for you and me. Turn over to chapter 10, would you please? Of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. And look there at verse number 10, would you please? Hebrews 10, beginning in verse number 10. By the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, and every priest standeth daily ministering and often offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Now read with me if you would please. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. And then there's another verse uh, that I want to read to you. I kind of lost my place. But the Bible tells us, he said it, oh, here it is, uh, Hebrews, and if you want to turn over there, Hebrews 7.25. And when, when you get there, I want you to read it out loud with me because that's where he is right now for you and me. Let's read it. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Jesus is praying for you and me today. Velma Cole, and some of you may have gotten this poem. How many of you did? All right, let me read it to you again. I thought it was excellent. She gave it to me this morning. She said she gave a card to my wife that had it in there, but she didn't give me the card. <laughs> I think it's hiding in her Bible. 
Uh, she, she usually gives me every car when we sit down, by the way. Those who give us cars, we sit down and we read that card together. And I pray for you. It says, if you look for me at Christmas, you won't need a special star. I'm no longer just in Bethlehem. I'm right there where you are. You may not be aware of me amid the celebrations. You'll have to look beyond the stores and all the decorations. But if you take a moment from your list of things to do and listen to your heart, you'll find I'm waiting there for you. Do you get that? You're the one I want to be with. You're the reason that I came. And you'll find me in the stillness as I'm whispering your name. And Jesus is whispering your name today. If you need to be saved, he's whispering your name. Call unto me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're a Christian, the Bible says, he's there waiting for you. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and I will bring rest to your souls. So where is he today? Is he in your schedule? Is he in your life? Is he in your choices, your decisions, what you're doing? Where is Jesus today? Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me as we come to this time of invitation? One of my favorite verses is in Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17. And it talks about he's in our midst. Dear friends, Jesus is in our midst right now. And there, in our midst, if you're not saved, he's knocking on your heart's door. You say, where do you find that? Revelation chapter 3. In verse 10, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come unto him and sup with him and he with me. I'm going to ask you the question. Where is he? He's knocking at your heart's door today. And he wants to come into your life. Will you let him? Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to present your word. Talk about where you are and where you want to be in our lives. And I pray for every adult here, every teenager, every child, that they'll get the true meaning of Christmas and find out where Jesus is in regards to their lives. May you take your word and speak to each one of our hearts that we will know where you are. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand?